I'd like to welcome everyone today to our Woodland Wildlife Wednesday webinar presented by the University of Maryland Extension's Woodland Stewardship Education Program. I'm Andrew Kling along with Agnes Kedmanes and our speaker today is Scott Smith. He's going to be joining us shortly to talk a little bit about conservation efforts for amphibians and reptiles in Maryland. But before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping to talk about. First off, I need to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and we do that, we need to let you know that for two reasons. One is for legal, legal reasons and the other is for practical reasons. For example, if you have to leave, you wanna catch the rest of the webinar or you wanna share it with someone else, you're certainly welcome to do so. We record this and then we'll post it on the Woodland Stewardship Education website at extension.umd.edu. We'll also post it on our YouTube channel and when the recording is available, I'll send out an email to everyone who registered so we know that it's available, let you know that it's available and you can share it with others. We also have a feature that you were able to opt in on or opt out of when you registered through Eventbrite and that's to get notices for upcoming webinars and workshops when we can get back to doing that face to face, as well as a subscription to our free quarterly newsletter called Branching Out. If you discover that you're getting more than one notification from us, you're, you're on another um, email list of ours, and you decide you, you only want to get one notice from us, we, uh, we certainly encourage you to let us know that you want one. And the easiest way to do that is by opting out by sending an email to Pam Thomas. Her email is pthomas, that's p-t-h-o-m-a-s, at umd.edu, and write in no events, and we'll make sure that we get that taken care of. And finally, if you have a question for Scott during the webinar, the easiest way to get our attention is to use the chat box, which is in, in the lower corner of your screen. Type in your question. We should have time at the end of the presentation to go through everything, uh, all the questions you may have had. And Scott will leave his uh, his contact information up at the end of the, the program to let you know uh, how to reach him if you have a question afterwards, you're interested more in the subject. And let me tell you a little bit about Scott before I turn things over to him. Scott received a BS in Natural Resources from the University of Rhode Island and an MS in wildlife management from Frostburg State. He's worked for the Maryland DNR for 30 years and is a wildlife ecologist with DNR's Natural Heritage Program. He currently conducts conservation efforts and applied research for reptiles and amphibians and their habitats, although in his career he's worked throughout the U.S. with birds and mammals, fish and shellfish, and plants. He's a native New Englander from Connecticut but he's lived in Maryland for 33 years and in Caroline County on the Eastern Shore for the past 30 years. He's married to a fellow wildlife bio biologist who works with us in the Woodland Stewardship Education Program, and they have a 25-year-old daughter who is a therapist in Baltimore. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Scott take over. So Scott, you can go ahead and share your screen and I'm gonna mute my microphone and let you Take it away. Okay, I'd like to thank Andrew and, and uh, Agnes for having me come on this uh, uh, this webinar today. And um, so, having worked in the department for 30 years, I have had a, a, a multitude of opportunities to work with many, many, many critters and on many projects. And um, there are really six main things that we do for conservation, large groupings for conservation. And the most foundational one of those is inventory and monitoring. We really need to know where species occur and also what their populations are doing. Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they stable? And we use this information for a lot of different purposes, but uh, what, what you see in front of you right now are a number of different rare, threatened, and, and endangered species that I've worked with over the years. And this is just a small sampling of them, but this inventory and monitoring is really important to figure out what is endangered? What does it mean to be endangered and that type of thing? Which species do we need to focus our efforts on? But we also focus efforts on common stuff too. And so um, just a few years ago, we finished up a five-year project 
It was really a citizen scientist project called the Maryland Amphibian and Reptile Atlas. We did this from 2010 to 2014. And I'm guessing that at least a few of you out there who are listening to me right now helped us with this. Um, it was just, we, we got tens of thousands of hours of effort from citizen scientists. And this book, uh, which was published in 2018, was the product of that work. And um, the citizen scientists actually even helped write the book. There are species accounts, um, two-page species accounts on every, every of the about 90 species of, of uh, reptiles, amphibians found in Maryland. And it includes uh, things about their natural history and then some nice maps, including this one of a timber rattlesnake, showing you where they currently occur, uh, but also comparing them to historic range. Another really key thing we do for conservation is applied research. Um, everything from uh, an amphibian malformation study we did on the Eastern Shore uh, to a, a ronavirus uh, surveillance we, we did as part of a five state effort. Uh, we looked it out at uh, Poplar Island. We did a terrapin mortality study looking at uh, commercial crab pots. And more recently, we've been looking at the impacts of stream restoration projects on bog turtles, which I'll get into a little bit more in a, in a little while. Um, another aspect of our conservation is land acquisition and management. And so we take the information we got from inventory and monitoring and from applied research, and we identify places on the landscape that we might want to purchase, uh, places we might want to see if the landowners will let us buy an easement, or places we just want to work with the private landowners. So for instance, on the left here, you see Hollingsworth Ponds, which is in Caroline County. Uh, we initially bought this one piece here about 25 years ago. And just in the last two or three years, we bought all these pieces down here and these parcels over here. And this was uh, a uh, interesting wetland community called the Carolina Bay, which I'm gonna go into in much more detail in a few minutes. And it harbors a lot of rare plants, but also interesting amphibians like this barking tree frog, which has stayed endangered. Over here on the right, we see, uh, this is in Harford County on some private property. This is a bog turtle site that um, multiflora rose, which is a non-native um, invasive plant, had completely taken over the wetland. And so during the winter one year, we removed all the multiflora rose, and this is what it looked like the following growing season. And the really cool thing about this is we instantly got successful nesting that year from this effort to this. So these are some of the kinds of things we do from a management standpoint. Um, I wear a lot of hats and one of those is a government regulator. We do environmental review. So we review residential and commercial developments. We review timber harvests. We, we review road projects, whether they're culvert replacements, bridge replacements, new roads. We look at those for impacts to rare, threatened and endangered species and their habitats. And we even review things like stream restorations and wetland restorations to make sure that what, what is being done is not going to negatively impact uh, some of these resources. Policy planning and enforcement is another really important conservation thing we do. Everything from updating our state list of rare, threatened, and endangered species to providing um, vernal pool conservation zones in our, in our state forest to protect vernal pool breeding amphibians to uh, developing in our Code of Maryland regulations, regulations on what reptiles and amphibians you can collect from the wild, how many you can have, what you can do with them, and the ones you can't. And this is all working, we do all this while we're working at the same time with various enforcement groups such as our natural resource police. And then last but not least, we do public education. Uh, from teaching this class today, leading reptile and amphibian or nature hikes, uh, having uh, displays at different public events, developing pamphlets and posters. Uh, we've just recently did a video on uh, uh, on um, disinfecting uh, your, your heavy equipment and other things uh, when you're doing uh, construction work. And we also have this great website, which I ask you to check out uh, and uh, just, just go into Maryland and maybe type in Maryland DNR reptiles or amphibians and you should be able to find us but it's a really great website that has a lot of good, good uh, information and photographs of our different reptiles and amphibians. Okay, so now I'd like to take two uh, case studies, one of an amphibian and one of a reptile, and kind of go through them, and you'll kind of see the different ways we do conservation. I would like to start first with the eastern tiger salamander. This is a state endangered species. It's not federally endangered, but it's state endangered. It is what we call a mole salamander. It spends a lot of its time underground in the burrows of small mammals like moles. 
This is our largest land salamander or terrestrial salamander, and it, it reaches a maximum length of about 13 inches. So they get really big, particularly the females. They reach sexual maturity in two to eight years, and they have a maximum longevity of about 25 years, which think about that. A lot of our uh, reptiles and amphibians have really long lives, and I don't think we, we really realize that. Probably most of you know that turtles live a long time, some of them up to 80 to 100 years. So, uh, some of our snakes live 25 to 30 years. Um, a lot of our frogs live eight to 10 years. And here we have a tiger salamander living up to 25 years. That's pretty amazing. So they tend to breed in the winter. They breed from November to April, but most, most breeding occurs in the, in the January thaw, which usually happens in late January or early February. Um, this past year, the um, breeding uh, first began on New Year's Eve, and the year before that, it began on Christmas Eve. But what is interesting is there's often a pause in their breeding when bad weather hits. So if things ice up, if things get really, really cold, which they do in the winter, um, they'll stop breeding, and then there'll be a pause, and then maybe a month later or six weeks later, they'll start up again. So because of this, their breeding um, effort is extremely variable within a year and between years. Adult females lay eggs every one to two years, and each female lays these gelatinous egg masses, which we see down here to the right, um, full of embryos, um, about five to eight of these egg masses, at, with a mean in Maryland of about 45 embryos per egg mass. Um, the, female, um, the female will, uh, during the breeding season, the males will put spermatophores in the, in the leaves on the bottom of the pool. The female will pick them up and internally fertilize the eggs, and then she'll lay the eggs attached to vegetation, typically near the pond bottom, but not, not always. And then fairly quickly, within about 24 hours, these egg, egg masses will fill with water and they become these voluminous um, gelatinous egg masses. Now we use the term for tiger salamander, tiger salamander egg masses as cirrus, um, which means they'll run through your fingers if you try to pick them up. Um, some of you maybe have tried to handle a spotted salamander egg mass. You can actually pick them up and they're solid. They won't run through your fingers, but tiger salamanders will. Now, they have a fairly long developmental period. The, uh, uh, the embryos, after they hatch out uh, from the uh, egg mass, which takes about 19 to 50 days, then they're in their larval period um, swimming around uh, in the ponds for two and a half to five months. So this is a really, really long developmental period, so they need to be breeding in ponds that have a really long hydro period. Uh, they metamorphose anywhere from June to August. Uh, this past year, I was at about two, two or three weeks ago dip netting ponds, and some of the ponds they'd already metamorphosed, but other ones, the later breeding ponds, there were still larvae looking like this in the ponds. Let's talk about those breeding ponds. In Maryland, they tend to be in what we call Carolina or Delmarva Bays. This is a specialized type of vernal pool that um, are seasonally flooded. Um, they dry out typically by summer, usually certainly by August. This is how they might look in a typical June year. And um, they're in these depressions um, and they're non-tidal and they're fresh water. And so because they dry out, fish populations cannot become established in them. And since fish are major predators of amphibians, this is a really good thing with no fish you really have a great place if you're a frog or a salamander to breed. And there's a lot of other cool critters in these, in these places. Now, one of the neat things about Carolina bays is they're really kind of unique. Oops, we went in the wrong direction there. They tend to have this uh, northwest to southeast orientation. They tend to be oval or circular in nature. Um, and in this case, these are four ponds that are all used by breeding tiger salamanders, but this is the main breeding pond and in years when this doesn't have enough water, they use this one and sometimes these two over here. Um, taking a, a going up a little bit higher in altitude, if we look at this is in Kent County, all these dark spots here, these are all different ponds. These are mostly Carolina bays. Some of them have their shape has been modified by humans using bulldozers and turning some into irrigation ponds or duck ponds or things like that. But these are all Carolina bays. And these actually spread right down the spine of the Delmarva Peninsula from Kent County uh, through, through Queen Anne's and Caroline and into Dorchester County. And in fact, they're, they're found on the coastal plain of the United States from southern New Jersey all the way down to northern Florida. Um, 
Some localized names we have for Carolina bays are potholes, whale wallers, and coastal plain ponds. Soil scientists from University of Maryland identified over 2,000 of these on Maryland's eastern shore, but interestingly enough, only about 1% of these have the open canopy that is really important for the rare, threatened, and endangered animals. And of course, here's some, some barking tree frogs uh, at one of the sites in Maryland. So they do have all these different rare plants and animals. The three main extremely rare amphibians they have in them are tiger salamanders, barking tree frogs, and carpenter frogs. Carpenter frogs are a watch list species. The plants tend to be a lot rarer, in fact, globally rare. We have some species such as uh, feather foil Hottonian flata, which was uh, last month we found it blooming at a number of these sites. It's a, just a beautiful plant. And this really, really extremely globally rare plant called Harper's Fimbri stylus or Harper's Fimbri, which is only about an inch tall and is um, it, it's found in the center of these ponds at the last place to dry out. And so I took this picture last October when we were doing surveys for these uh, in the now dried out ponds, um, extremely rare plant. Back to tiger salamanders. Tiger salamanders have a really large distribution, which is why they're not federally listed. But if you look at this, uh, they tend to be concentrated in the Midwest uh, states, and then they're, they're on the East Coast. But as, as you can see, they have a very disjunct range on the East Coast with quite a few places where they're completely extirpated from, they're gone from. If we look at legal status, and this is from NatureServe, the colors here, the yellow, orange, and red mean they're, uh, they're not doing well, they're rare, threatened, or endangered. And blue means they've been extirpated from those areas. So if we look at this, they're not doing really well anywhere on the East Coast. And even in the Midwest, they have some problems in Ohio and Michigan and up into Canada, like in Manitoba, and they're gone from Ontario and Pennsylvania. If you look at states surrounding Maryland, they're endangered at all the states they occur in, occur in around us. They've been extirpated from Pennsylvania and they don't occur in West Virginia. If we look at Maryland, they're currently only known from two counties, Kent and Caroline, and we have 20 ponds that have them. We also have a pond just over the line in Delaware from Dorchester. The adults do uh, spend some time in Maryland and Dorchester County, so we kind of share a population uh, with Delaware there. But you can see historically they occurred on the coastal plain on both the eastern and western shores, and have since um, at all these sites have been extirpated, and we haven't been able to find any in these other counties. Now, if we, if we compare these 20 current ponds occupied in Caroline and Kent counties to historic records, back in 1984, when Charlie Stein, who's kind of the dean of tiger salamander um, researchers, did all his work and published his famous paper in 84, they were only found at seven ponds at that time in 1984. So over the, over the past 35, 36 years, they've, they've increased a little bit to 20 ponds, but they're still just found in those two counties. They're completely gone from Queen Anne's County, or we haven't been able to find them, and they're not in any of these other counties either. So this is an, a state endangered species that is really just hanging on here, but we have been doing a lot of management to try and expand that, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. So how do we look for tiger salamanders? Well, we have three main survey uh, survey methods. We do visual surveys, we do dip net surveys, and we do tracking. The, the visual surveys are what we do most of the time. And the, and the visual surveys primarily, um, I'm getting a lot of feedback from somebody right now. Um, the visual surveys are done primarily using either a plexiglass bottom buckets or a specially designed plexiglass bottom device or just visually. Uh, we try to do these surveys on sunny days when there's little wind and the water in the, in the breeding ponds tends to be very clear. So if you wear polarized sunglasses, you can look down and see the egg masses. And what we're really mostly doing are egg mass counts. So you notice the stakes these folks up here on the right are carrying. We stake the egg masses and we do this to mark off where they are so we don't step on them, but also to aid us in counting them because we'll do repeated counts about once every 10 days to two weeks and go back to a site to get uh, more accurate counts. We don't wanna double count um, the egg masses and we don't wanna be stepping on ones that are already there. So here's what the egg masses look like again. We also do dip net surveys, but we do these less often. And these are done in 
uh, May and early June, usually in May if we can do them. And you're really just trying to find out, okay, was, was breeding successful? Are we seeing some, some larvae? And so this year we did some, and, and again, I, I think I spoke about this earlier, some of the ponds that had bred really early, they had already left. And other ponds, we did catch some larvae like this one here. Now, we do get to see adults sometimes when we're doing egg mass surveys, particularly if we time our, our visits right. And if we bring a dip net with us, we're able to catch some animals. Typically, there tend to be males. Um, the males stay in the ponds for most of the breeding season, whereas the females just come, breed, and then they're gone. We also do this trapping, but we've only done this the last couple of years. Um, this is based on some work done in the Midwest and then here in Maryland by Dr. Eric Leibgold at Salisbury University. We use a standard minnow pot. We open up the opening a little bit wider to allow uh, egg-filled females in. And this is kind of the kicker. We bait them with glow sticks, the kind of things your kids might carry around on Halloween. And we've been testing pipe cleaners. Now, some work that um, was done in the Midwest found that uh, amphibians are attracted to glow sticks uh, as bait. And so you don't have to put a live smelly bait in, you can just use glow sticks. And work by Dr. Leibgold at Salisbury discovered that orange glow sticks work best. And he, he theorizes that these mimic the Eastern fairy shrimp, which occur in these, these, uh, these wetlands that the tiger salamanders feed on. Now this past year, I, I got kind of concerned about the amount of waste that we're producing by these glow sticks and their potential toxicity in the environment. So um, I started using orange pipe cleaners. And these are good because you can reuse them again and again and again, and they seem to be working really well. Um, next year, we're gonna do a neat study comparing the glow sticks to the pipe cleaners to an unbaited trap. If we look at some of the data that Eric Leibgold and his students captured um, from 2015 to 2018, we can see that these traps do a really good job of catching males and they do not do a good job of catching females. So population estimates he, he developed from mark recapture for males at this pond here, Massey Pond, were about 100 males at that site, but they only captured six females. And then another pond we call TP3, only 14 males and no females, yet we had egg masses. And we know that this, this many egg masses represents a lot more than six females. So the sex ratios that he got from his work showed about a 14, 14 males to every females, but it's probably more like 10 to one. We still don't know if this is normal in, a, in populations or if this is a sign of some, some problems and we're still, we're still researching that. Now talking again about these breeding ponds, um, these vernal pools or Carolina bays, you know, we view them as being very, very important and they are. And through our Maryland non-tidal wetland regulations, uh, these vernal pools get a 25 foot buffer around them and if they have an endangered species in them, they get a 100 foot buffer on them. But we know from the life history of all these different uh, amphibians that this is extremely inadequate. Instead of buffers, these upland areas are actually life zones for these animals. In fact, if we look at marbled salamanders and spotted and Jefferson and wood frogs, we see that anywhere from about 350 up to about five, uh, 600 feet are what are really needed. And tiger salamanders are all the way out here, about 650 feet. So you really need about a 650 foot upland area around a pond if you really want to protect um, where the tiger salamanders are spending about 95% of their life um, for effective conservation. So how does this play out in the real world? Well, here's some data. This is an egg mass counts data for Massey Pond in Kent County over about a um, 45 year period. This actually I think is the longest egg mass um, count data done anywhere in, in the world. And, uh, at least for tigers. And the data from uh, 1976 to about 1995 is from Charlie Stein's data. And you can see it's highly variable. Every year, there's a dramatic difference in how many egg masses are found. But look at this peak up here, 270 egg masses back in about 1981. Now then something happened. Well, this is all privately owned at that time. And the landowner was getting ready to sell this site to the Department of Natural Resources, to us, because we realized it was a really important site. Well, he did a timber harvest in the surrounding upland area in 1996. And as you can see, the population crashed. In fact, it was doing really poorly. And then right around here, around 2005, we began to do some vegetation management, <coughs> excuse me, in the pond basin. And, and you can see this past year, we had about 90 egg masses. So we went from an intact buffer 
to a buffer that was heavily impacted by the heavy machinery used in a timber harvest um, to a population that took about 25 years post-harvest to begin to bounce back to now they're not quite where they were, but they're getting there. So how does this play out in the real world also? So here's Massey Pond. Here's that pond. The timber harvest occurred in this whole area here. It was not a clear cut. It was a what we call a diameter li limit cut or a, a high grade where they took out all the large veneer quality trees. Um, and unfortunately, um, they, they cut almost right up to the pond edge. And um, they used a lot of heavy equipment, which left huge ruts in the, in the soil. And we believe most of the adults that were in underground at this time were killed during the timber harvest. Um, also, the timber harvest opened up the soil to, to solar radiation and soil temperatures got really high and dried out some of the soil. But within, within about 10 years, we see that the site has revegetated. And then we decided to revegetate this agricultural field that was adjacent to it. And you can see here a 2018 aerial photo down below here showing that whole area um, has, has uh, reforested. Now, the other thing that we did um, back in the mid 2000s was the basin itself was filling up with trees and invasive uh, herbaceous vegetation. So using a mixture of, um, of cutting and injecting herbicides, we selectively killed a bunch of trees that were in the basin. We also hand pulled, <coughs> excuse me, the invasive herbaceous vegetation, which resulted eventually in that increasing population that we saw. <coughs> excuse me. Now we've taken what we've learned from, from that effort and Beth Schlimm on our staff has begun a project at Millington Wildlife Management Area in Kent County. Uh, she's identified 11 ponds where she's doing similar type vegetation management in the pond basin to open up that canopy so light can come in. And um, she's doing this uh, connecting a whole bunch of known tiger salamander breeding ponds, <coughs> excuse me, to act as stepping stones between these sites. So there's kind of travel corridors for these, this population to freely move. Taking this same concept a step further and on a larger landscape scale, <clears throat> this is a project that we've been working with the Nature Conservancy for about 25 or 30 years in Caroline County called the Crescent Preserve. It takes five properties that are already owned by either the Nature Conservancy or Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and we're trying to add onto it with recent acquisitions or get easements on other properties or just work with landowners in this area to try and connect all these different um state and, and TNC owned properties into one large preserve that is um, gonna be basically a long-term landscape level preserve for the continuity of these species uh, on the landscape for a long time. Okay, that's tiger salamanders. Let me shift gears, <coughs> excuse me, and talk about bog turtles. Bog turtles are federally and state listed as threatened they're one of the smallest turtles in the world uh, with a uh, maximum length of about four and a quarter inches. They have delayed sexual maturity, which is typical of most turtles of eight to 10 years for females. They have a maximum longevity of about 55 years and they ma mainly occurs in April and May. And here's the difference between males and females, the shape of the shell, the bottom uh, of the shell, the plastron and their tails and where their cloacas are. Bog turtles are known for this beautiful orange neck patch, and they also often have, at least younger animals, have this beautiful sculptured effect on their, um, on their shells. They, they nest um, in raised elevated areas in the wetlands uh, where they occur typically on sedge tussocks, peat mats, and in root wads. Females lay one to six eggs um, annually, only one clutch per year, usually from mid-June to early July. Um, but unfortunately, because these nests are barely hidden, they have really high nest predation rates, um, which I'll get into in a little bit more. And here's here's one as it's uh, hatching out. And here's a nest with a re recently hatched out youngster and a couple eggs getting ready to hatch out. Um, a lot of people think about turtles as living in ponds and water, but this is really a, a wet sedge meadow. It's a mud turtle. It lives in the mud. And so here's a um, a, a wet sedge or a poor fen that it, it lives in, in in Harford County. This picture was taken in late May, early June. And here's one in the winter 
when the sedge tussocks have died back and they look like grass skirts. And you can see this open water. These are, um, these are all spring fed. So the water temperature uh, near the spring heads is in the low 50s year round. And this is what the turtles do when they're trying to escape us or escape predators. They will burrow down into the mud fairly, fairly quickly. They're semi-aquatic. And they'll overwinter underneath the root mats of shrubs and tussock sedges and in tunnels underneath this mud. Uh, these wetlands are unbelievably great biodiversity hotspots, particularly for amphibians and reptiles, including these frogs and toads and turtles, um, including their close cousin, the spotted turtle. And lots of really interesting amphibians, including these salamanders. And the northern red salamander, which we see up here in the left-hand corner, is the most common salamander we found associated with these sites. There's also a really cool snake called the queen snake, which feeds exclusively on molted uh, crayfish. So it needs soft-shelled crayfish. It's got this really specialized diet. Now, this snake is not only just found in these types of wetlands. They're also found in Piedmont and coastal plain streams but it is really one of the cooler snakes we have in Maryland. There's also some interesting rare plants. This is the most common rare plant. It's a state threatened plant called the Canada Burnett, Sanguisorba canadensis. And it's, um, it's flowering right now. It puts out a three to five foot flowering stalk. It's a, a wet prairie uh, uh, species. It's kind of a remnant of the last ice age, just a really cool uh, uh, plant. And then our state butterfly, the Baltimore checker spot. Most of the sites in Maryland we know of for this species are bog turtle wetlands. And what's really cool is that its host plant is the white turtle head, Chelone glabra. So there's kind of a circularity to this whole thing with bog turtle wetlands and, and rare butterflies in this plant. And there's some other really interesting uh, um, invertebrates in these sites too. Bog turtles are found um, in 13 states on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. This is their global population. We have a northern population, which includes uh, parts of New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and, and Pennsylvania. Um, they're extirpated from western Pennsylvania. There's this little isolated population up in the Finger Lakes region of New York. And then, of course, we have the bulk of the world's population right here, including northeastern Maryland. The southern population is mostly in North Carolina and Virginia. It barely gets into Tennessee, Georgia, and South Carolina. In Maryland, bog turtles are known from only four counties in the northeastern part of the state, Carroll, Baltimore, Harford, and Cecil. Um, and of all the sites that have been occupied since they were first discovered here in 1941, only about half of those sites still harbor bog turtles. So they've, they've had a pretty big decline um, over time. Now, what is this decline from? Well, a lot of it has to do with land use. Typically, a lot of these wetlands were grazed. And we, we've noticed over time that there is a definite relationship between lack of grazing and increased woody plant succession. So if we look at this over time, and if we, if we were to extend this down to now, the number of sites being grazed in Maryland is probably about uh, 12 to 15%. And with this declining of sites that are being grazed in Maryland, we also see a declining bog turtle population. Now, the, the, the dairy herd, um, dairy farming in Maryland kind of hit its peak in the 1950s and has been declining ever since. And a lot of the larger farms are being sold off as uh, the farmers die and their heirs are, are looking at um, uh, capitalizing on, on the monetary end of it rather than uh, the tradition of farming. And so we see a lot of traditional large family farms broken up into smaller pieces. Many of these are developed um, or no longer grazed anyways. And so this changing land use we've seen have effect on bog turtles. Now, um, cattle and other types of grazers are kind of a proxy animal uh, for traditional grazers and browsers that occurred in these wetlands prior to European colonization. So we had woodland bison and we had elk here in Maryland that would, um, would feed in these sites before we all showed up. And beaver played a really active role in the landscape back then, uh, opening up areas cutting down trees. And of course, beaver are making a pretty big comeback. But one of the problem with them now is, A, we have a lot less sites for bog turtles. So when they flood out of sight, the bog turtles are kind of left without a home. And secondly, after the site gets flooded out, or excuse me, after they leave and the, and the water recedes, we're left with a layer of silt that typically gets um, 
uh, colonized by invasive plants like reed canary grass, which forms these monocultures, which are really hard to get rid of. We also have problems with other invasive non-natives like multiflora rose, but some of our, our native plants also connect invasively. Red maple, um, these sites, um, their climax community is a red maple swamp, and to, to maximize them for bog turtles, we really want to keep them as open canopy, early successional habitats. So we kind of, we view red maple as kind of our enemy in this particular setting. We also have that same view of cattails. Cattails will completely take over a site. And so we've done a lot of different management for them, which I'll get into in a minute. We've also had a history of threats to these sites of their, of their hydrology. Historically, sites have been drained through drainage ditches. And even now, um, Farmers are allowed to maintain drainage ditches to do annual maintenance of them. So we still have some problems with drainage ditches. Wetland fill is less of a, of a problem unless it's illegal, but that, that has been a, a historically a problem. Uh, back in the 1970s, a lot of our sites were turned into ponds and they were completely lost. And then of course we have drain tiles, which are, there's some, um, these are, uh, this is a PVC tube with holes in it that's uh, run through the wetland. And uh, the older ones are made out of clay but um, there's different types of drain tiles that, that drain the change the hydrology. Development also plays a couple of different insidious roles. One is it, it pretty much um, takes over the buffer and it can cause um, runoff and different types of things that will happen in the wetland itself that will decrease water quality or quantity. But also we have human subsidized predators like red fox and raccoon that really like feeding on dog food and other things we leave out and garbage we have around our, our homes. And so right now we see uh, raccoon populations at their historic high. Now, one of the problems we have with bog turtles that we don't have with a lot of other species is poaching. Bog turtles are, are worth a lot of money on the global black market pet, uh, pet trade. Um, while it's illegal to collect them, they are collected illegally. And so poaching is a real issue and so um, giving out location information on these sites is really uh, verboten and they're, they're just considered very sensitive areas. This is a problem we have with a few other species too, but uh, bog turtles are probably um, one of the ones that are worth the most globally. So how do we survey for bog turtles? <clears throat> well, there's different types of survey protocols that have been de developed by the Fish and Wildlife Service with the state's input. Uh, the first one is to de determine potential habitat. We call these phase one surveys. But the second one, and this is kind of where we have the most fun, are phase two surveys. This is to, to determine if a wetland has bog turtles. Are they present or are they absent? And this is a lot of muddling and, and walking around and sticking your hand underneath vegetation and down at the tunnels and feeling for them during uh, with, with some set temperature criteria and during a certain time of the year. And if we do repeated... Um, uh, phase two surveys where we mark the turtles and then recapture them, we can actually do some population estimates of sites. We also do phase three surveys, which are trapping. And the trapping protocol we have is a minimum effort of 20 traps per acre for 20 consecutive days. If you trap in the spring and if you trap in September, it's 40 traps per acre for 20 consecutive days. And here's some results from a trapping effort we did at a Cecil County site in September of 2017. These yellow lines are where we put out drift fences. These were silt fences that impede the movement of turtles and it kind of forces them to go into the traps we set, which these are a trap called a fahey trap, which is an unbaited trap um, with a door that, that um, the turtle actually pushes up with their shell and they go in there and they get trapped. And you can see the results of this particular trapping effort. We had 22 captures of 11 individual turtles. So this is a pretty successful effort. We also have a lot of different types of uh, applied research going on with bog turtles. We've been putting transmitters on turtles the last couple winters and tracking them at stream restoration sites to find out how they, um, what kind of impacts we might see from the heavy equipment that's being used um, in these stream restoration projects. So here's a transmitter on the shell of a turtle, and this is called an I button. It's a temperature data logger, and we can get temperature data on the turtles, which is this yellowish green line here. Um, and we put out some temperature data loggers um, in the air and in the water. And so the blue is air temperature and the red is the average um, water temperature. And, and we could see that in the winter, these turtles are actually coming to the surface on warm days. One thing we don't know is, are they doing this 
uh, more because of uh, disturbance from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the heavy equipment, or is this just normal behavior, or is it due to climate change? Another neat study we have going on right now is with the Maryland Zoo. We're doing a disease screening and genetic study with them, drawing blood and swabbing turtles um, to uh, collect for analysis for various types of diseases. We don't have any results from this yet, but it's a really great cooperative effort with the zoo. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Different types of site management we do. We have done some prescribed burning at a bunch of sites. This is a, a large burn we did quite a few years ago at a, about an eight acre site in Harford County. We do various invasive vegetation management of both native vegetation like cattails and non-native vegetation like multiflora rose. And this is using a herbicide, usually glyphosate is the, the one herbicide we tend to use. A chainsawing of woody vegetation for red maple and other other types of woody vegetation control. And just recently, in fact, this picture I took two weeks ago, uh, doing mechanical control of cattails with a brush cutter, just repeatedly cu uh, cutting these during the growing season and removing seed heads to not eliminate them, but to try and allow some other native stuff to come in so, um, um, so there's some better uh, diversity of habitat. <clears throat> we also do a lot of grazing management and develop grazing management plans. And fence installation is a really important part of that. We've been doing a lot of conservation grazing with goats and sheep, and the, the fencing and grazing management plans we do in coordination with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and Fish and Wildlife Service. We've actually, um, excuse me, uh, a, a number of uh, landowners have actually been paid to uh, graze sites with goats or even with cattle or with sheep, and we've had some really good results from this. Um, and, and you've probably seen this done in some other states for some other species besides bog turtles. And lastly, at a site in Harford County, uh, they put a bunch of fill in the wetland back in the 70s. And we went in, we, fit, we found all the turtles that were in the area, we removed them. And during the winter, we uh, set up a silt fence to keep the turtles from wandering into the work area. We removed all the fill material. And now I, I don't have a picture of what it looks like now, but it's a beautiful uh, grassy wet wetland. And we, we found 21 different species of reptiles and amphibians now using this area that before was just a pile of dirt. So we have a two scale conservation strategy for bog turtles. Um, the one is at the site level where we do all this type of vegetation management and grazing management, restoring the hydrology, es establishing buffers. We have bought a few sites, but we have mostly done a lot of different conservation easement work, primarily with the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. And then at, at the watershed level at a larger scale, trying to establish some connectivity between these different populations through stream buffers and stream restorations. And there's a lot of different federal programs we've been able to use. So there's four main players in Maryland doing this, DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, and the State Highway Administration, which actually owns and manages a lot of land in Maryland. But the key thing here is, and I failed to say this earlier, about 97% of the sites in Maryland are on private property. So landowners are key in developing relationships like we have with these two great landowners here that are wearing their bog turtle t-shirts are really, really critical. <clears throat> So that's all I have to talk about today. I'd like to acknowledge all the many people, um, and this doesn't do them all credit, that I've, I've worked with over the years on these two different projects, including a whole bunch of qualified bog turtle surveyors, countless volunteers, and of course the landowners themselves. So now I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, and I'm gonna put a slide up here in a second uh, that is my contact information. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Andrew and I can take questions now. Okay, Scott, great, thanks. That's uh, an awful lot of wonderful information and I agree, landowners are definitely the key to making sure that everyone has uh, a role in, in this uh, conservation effort. Um, you have plenty of time for questions and I wanna join one, I wanna ask one first, going back to the uh, tiger salamanders. I was fascinated by the crescent preserve idea. Uh, can you give us an idea of size of the preserve, how big it is, you know, say east to west, north to south. Whoa, um, well, let me think about that. Um, so if you know where Bridgetown is in Caroline County, you probably don't, um, but that's Route 3, let me think, is that 310, 302? It extends from there almost to the Del to the Delaware line, actually. So it's, it's um, I'm going to say it's probably at least 
it's at least a five to five to eight mile uh, stretch, and it's probably about a mile wide. So it's it's a, it's it's a pretty huge task um, in front of us. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions about volunteering. Uh, some folks are interested oh, in yeah. in joining you to do some volunteering. Who do they contact, and how do they do that? They can contact me using the contact information that I, I put up, um, which I can put back up again if you'd like me to. Um, and uh, we do screen volunteers because we are taking people to highly sensitive areas with species that are um, collected for the pet trade. Uh, we, we require volunteers to give us a resume and three references that can kind of tell us that they're ethical. And, and, and so we screen volunteers and then then uh, when you volunteer, we make you sign some forms that say you're not going to divulge where we take you or, or we're going to shoot you. No, just kidding. Um, and um, we also, uh, the good thing about it, though, is we can use volunteer hours as matches for our federal grants because most of this work I've shown you has been, was paid for through grant, um, grant money. So we can use volunteer hours for grants. Um, we're welcome to take people. Um, it can be very physically demanding. Um, you're going to need either hip boots or chest waders, depending on what we're doing. Um, so, you know, you need to... Uh, you need to be at least healthy and, and have some, some equipment too. Yeah, go ahead and put your uh, contact information back up if you would, Scott. Okay, let me find that. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, is my screen still being yeah. shared? It is. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's perfect. Just okay. leave it. I'll Excellent. Leave, I'll leave that up and we can go, continue with questions. Okay. Uh, another, another question was at the beginning, you mentioned a Maryland herb atlas published based on citizen science. And the uh, question was, are you aware of any other states that have published similar atlases or use, utilize citizen science in this way? Yes, um, Delaware is currently doing an atlas, but I'm not sure they're doing as much a citizen science effort as we did in Maryland. Pennsylvania has one going on right now and their web, you can actually collect information in Pennsylvania and enter it in the website. I think the Delaware one too, you can enter data through a website. Um, most of the Northeast states have done these at least once. We were actually, Maryland was kind of behind the eight ball. Um, Vermont did one many years ago. New Jersey did one many years ago. Um, Rhode Island's planning on starting one soon. Um, I, I want to say Ohio either did one. Oh, New York did one, though. I'm not sure if they published their results or not. New York did a 10-year ten, a effort. Ours was five years. We will probably redo ours in another 10 years. So I'll, I'll, I'll redo it when I'm a retiree. I, I'll volunteer as a re retiree to help with the, the next effort. One of the people joining us said, thank you for the wonderful presentation and said uh, he and a couple of the other people working or who are on the webinar with us are working on the CNO canal with the SCA student conservation folks. Our main focus is vegetation removal from historic structures and campgrounds. We try to be conscientious of invasive, mm -hmm. spe and plant, invasive plant species when engaging in our work and do a bit of selective cutting. Are there any species that are particularly helpful to rare animal species? Are there any plant species or any species that we they could collect some information for us? Because the CNO Canal is an amazing place. Um, it's really, a, a, I don't know how long is it, what is it, 120 miles, 200 miles, whatever. And much of it is a vernal pool because it's no longer used and it's you know blocked off in different areas. So um, it's become a huge breeding area for Jefferson salamanders for upland chorus frogs, um, uh, spotted turtles, um, and the uh, adjacent to it in the Potomac River and its tribs, we see a lot of wood turtles. And th th those are all species that we're re really interested in collecting information on. Now, as far as, so my presentation on tiger salamanders showed us opening up the canopy of some Carolina bays on the shore to help out tiger salamanders. That would be the wrong thing to do in some sites like a CNO Canal because many of the amphibians, well, you might be able to, to do it at a couple spots for Jefferson salamanders because they do like the open canopy. But a lot of our vernal pool breeding amphibians prefer closed or partially closed canopy, things like wood frogs and spotted salamanders. So it's kind of a, mi a mixed bag. They could certainly, if it was completely uh, a vernal pool that was, or part of the CNO that was completely shaded over, Possibly letting a little light in at a couple spots might be a good thing. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing they could do. Um, of course, any non-native uh, plants in there would be nice to promote natives. 
Um, it's a very difficult job to do, and you kind of have to pick and choose where you do that work because um, our landscape is really overrun with non-native plants, and so you really have to decide where is it worth the effort. <clears throat> Next question. Okay. Um... Here we go. How would you go about evaluating a site for a bog turtle study? There have been, they have been found downstream from the site this person is thinking about. Okay. How would I evaluate a site? Well, I walk in and if, um, if I walk into the site and I sink up to my ankles in mud, um, that's usually a good sign. Um, if, there's, if there are deep water areas, it's not a good sign. It's probably more of a spotted turtle site. Um, if you have a lot of herbaceous vegetation, different sedges and rushes, um, particularly tussock forming vegetation, like, um, like that tussock sedge I showed, that's really a good sign. Um, so, I mean, there's really three criteria. Soil needs the muck, it needs the vegetation, and it needs the hydrology. And of those, hydrology is the most important, and muck is number two, and vegetation is number three. We certainly have some sites that are completely taken over by invasive vegetation that the turtles still use. So that's why if you have the hydrology in the soils, you could still have turtles, even if it's overrun with like reed canary grass. Okay, next question. Is the department working on reintroduction projects for any reptile or amphibian species in Maryland? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so I had a discussion with uh, one of my uh, counterparts out in Western Maryland and uh, we have a, a state endangered species called the hellbender. It's really, it's the largest salamander in Eastern North America. It's an amazing critter that's found in these larger rivers out there. And um, they're planning, uh, uh, trying to find some funding to do some um, head starting where they would, uh, th th right now they're putting in these artificial nesting structures and they're, they're being used pretty well and collecting some of the egg masses from the nesting structures and hatch them out in captivity and then uh, raise the young till they get to a certain size and then release them back into those areas to kind of um, head start the population. Um, head starting is being done for uh, diamondback terrapins, our state reptile. That's been going on for about 20 years. I'm um, at Poplar Island in Talbot County, and there's uh, um, the school systems in both the eastern and western shore are heavily involved in an, an, um, efforts both at Poplar and so uh, I guess the um, Arlington Echo um, in Anne Arundel County and the Baltimore Aquarium are involved in that. Um, there are some efforts going, um, we're actually talking about moving egg masses for tiger salamanders, um, at some of these sites that Beth Schlimm has been leading the effort to open up the canopy and, and, uh, turn them into potential, uh, tiger salamander sites. Um, there has been in the past a, an attempt to captively breed, uh, bog turtles at the, at the, what was then the Baltimore Zoo, but, um, through a series of misfortunes that, that, that project failed. And we've, um, we have held up on starting a new one. Um, there has been successful captive breeding of uh, and release into the wild in Tennessee of bog turtles. And they're starting a project in, um, in New Jersey that started two years ago. Um, so there, you know, there, there are some attempts at this. One of the things about captive breeding and, re and releasing young into the wild is you have to first identify why the population got in trouble in the first place. And if you haven't dealt with the issues that um, made it decline in the first in the first place, then you're kind of releasing animals to their certain death. So you know you really have to take care of some of the problems, and then use use this captive breeding to augment the populations or even establish new ones. Next question, please. Okay, I had uh, uh, another question myself. Uh, you mentioned the relationship between bog turtles and grazers, including the relationship with beaver. Was there any impact when nutria were found, especially on the eastern shore? So bog turtles range is just in the northeastern part of the state, and the nutria were just in Dorchester, from like Dorchester, I think they might have gotten the tall, but Dorchester, Wicomico, Worcester County, Somerset County. So um, the nutria were never in the areas where where bog turtles occur. Okay. Not being a native Marylander, I wasn't sure about that. I just read that they had been in, in the state and uh, the DNR had done their level best to get rid of them and apparently had done a pretty good job. 
Yeah, it, well, it was it was a it was a DNR Fish and Wildlife Service and a, a lot of private entity, entities uh, er, er, eradicated them, and it took many many years and thousands and thousands of hours of effort of of people to get that done. Okay, well, I guess we've answered all the questions everyone has for Scott. Oh, one more, one more. Have you encountered hybridization involving rare species? Yeah, yeah. So we've uh, <clears throat> we found some uh, bog turtle, spotted turtle hybrids, which um, were, were already known in, in the literature. They'd been found in Pennsylvania before, so we've found some bog spotted hybrids. Um, we already know that our uh, um, Fowler's toads and American toads hybridize, particularly on the western shore in like Calvert County and uh, um, some of the counties over, over in that area, Anne Arundel County, um, and those counties over there, St. Mary's County, boy, I'm in trouble pulling that one out. Um, anyways, um, so hybridization does occur um, in some species. And of course, there's a lot of interesting things that happen genetically with animals anyways. You, you know, you get everything from albinism to uh, partial albinism to melanism. And, you know, there's a lot of different, uh, the whole, a spectrum of, of different morphological changes you can see in species. Uh, and then there's some some species like uh, take a hognose snake. Um, they are naturally many different colors from jet black to gray to pink to orange to yellow to brown. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there's certain species that just have some amazing natural variation and others don't. But. Okay, another question. Is Poplar Island considered a success for herps? Well, it's a success for, for, um, for terrapins. Um, it's mostly tidal and, and it's mostly, it, it's a saline environment. So um, amphibians aren't gonna really do too well out there. Um, and surprisingly, they've also discovered that king snakes are doing really well out there. And there are species that we have some concern about. So Eastern king snakes, that's, that's kind of neat, but it's, it's certainly become a source population for terrapins. And so that, that has been a, you know, a really successful um, use of dredge spoil from the Baltimore Harbor um, and to uh, build up a historic island. And actually the island's now bigger than it historically was. And it, as soon as they started building it, the terrapins came and started nesting there. And Ohio University has been working for about 20 years now uh, with, um, with the state and federal government to, uh, you know, to, uh, um, uh, monitor that population and do different types of enhancement techniques and and uh, and and also head start those young. It's it's actually a, a probably one of the most successful head starting programs for turtles on the planet. I mean, it's certainly um, people all over the country are using the um, the the booklet they've put together of how to head start uh, terrapins, how to do it uh, from that effort. So it's it's been highly successful. Okay, that's. I believe the last question we have, I want to thank, uh, thank Scott for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, just about run out of time, so I think we will go ahead and let you know what else is coming up. We have uh, another webinar coming up scheduled on July 29th with Landowner Liability and Recreation Access in Maryland. That's Jonathan Kays with the University of Maryland Extension. If you're a landowner and you're <clears throat> interested in letting people come on your land for hunting or access to wetlands or waterways, be sure to join us for that. It's usually a very pop popular topic and that'll be on July 29th. If you didn't get a chance to write down Scott's contact information, you can always drop me a line. Andrew Kling at aklang1 at umd.edu. And if you have any questions about the webinar series in general, we'll be happy to spend some time with you and share a little bit about it. But that's all the time we have today. I want to thank Scott for joining us. I want to thank Agnes for helping out and thank all of you for joining us. We'll let you know when the recording is available and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for participating. <laughs>